When we tell the story of, of the Rebbe, the Kavonov, and that is the purpose of that is that to reveal more Kedusha in the world. And because he sees something above nature, that helps you to see something more in this world. When it says in Chumash, which we just learned recently, and Pashas Yisroi, it says before Matan Teirin, by Yemer Hashem El Moshe, the Avish speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu, and he says, Hinni boy lech of Av Onon, I'm going to reveal, reveal myself to you in the thickness of a cloud. Bisham Yoham Bedabri Imoch, the people, the Yidim will hear the way I speak to you, and as a result of that, is the Gam Bacho Yaminu Loilum. So they will have a moon in you also, as we say in the davening every day, Vayaminu Bahashem Uva Meisha Abdi. Says that Shimon Ba Yechoi, the Rashbi, he who believes in Meisha Rabbeinu is considered that he believes in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And he who has shown does not believe in Meisha Rabbeinu, it's considered that he doesn't believe in Hashem. We believe in Meshach Rabbeinu because he is that individual that he has that direct connection to Kodesh Baruch Hu. Shlash, we say that we, shlash, we tell the story of the Rebbe, it's not to make the Rebbe bigger, because we show them, we're not going to make him bigger. It's only that as a result of this story, we see that HaKodesh, the Rebbe is so close to Kodesh Baruch Hu, and he becomes, so to say, the conveyor, the intermediary, through whom HaKodesh Baruch Hu brings down reveals godliness into this world. The previous Rebbe once said that when you hear a miser from a Rebbe, don't come and say that you heard it already. Because if Prodis, by divine providence, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made that you should hear this story again, said the Baal Shem Tev, that from everything that we see and from everything that we hear, <laughs> This is a message being sent to that individual from above how to improve his relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So said the Rebbe Rayat that when you hear a story from a tzaddik, even if you heard it before, but being that by HaShlokha Protest, you, you hear the story now, you have to ask yourself, why did Hashem make that I should hear this story now again? It's assuming that the story has a special message to strengthen me in my way to Hashem. So I'll, I'll, when I tell stories, it could be that you heard it before, but based on what the Rabbi, Rabbi Yad says, it should be like a new story. <coughs> this Misa, we heard, and me and another two people, we heard this from the individual of whom the Misa took place. And we heard this story about three years ago. The story is that he was invited to a wedding in Holy Taylor, and it was a very large crowd. When the chosen came in, of course, everybody started to dance, but he noticed that an elderly gentleman was sitting by the side of the table, and all he was doing is clapping with his hand, but he didn't participate physically in the dancing. And the young man, the young man tells him he doesn't know why, but something came to him he should ask this Yid, who is he? So he goes over and he gives him Shalom Aleichem, and he asks him, may I know what is your connection to this Chosen? And he says, I happen to be the grandfather of the Chosen. He said, you're the grandfather of the Chosen, you should be one of the first to dance with the Chosen. What are you sitting at the table? He says, I'll tell you. He says, a week before the wedding, my grandson, the Chosen, came to me, and he says, Zayde, we are sure that you want to give us a present for the wedding. So I tell them, what kind of question? So the Hassan says, could we suggest to you what the present should be? So he tells this young man, I told my grandson, I don't sign a blank check. I have to know what you're going to offer me, what you're going to tell me. I'll see if it's possible. So he tells this young man, my grandson told me that you were born about 70 odd years before in Russia. And at that time, it was very dangerous to make a bris. 
being that we want to give you a bracha under the chuppah, we do want that the bracha should be said after you have a bris. And being that there's still a whole week before the wedding, maybe during this week you'll have the bris. So he tells this oh man, such a, 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 such a present I cannot refuse. And just two days ago, I had the bris, so I'm not in a physical condition to get up to dance. Oh Says the younger man, he doesn't know why. He put his hand in his pocket, and he takes out a dollar. And he tells this gentleman, if a person in your age is ready to have a bris miller, you have to get a present. And my present to you is a dollar from the Rebbe that I got. And the young man says, when this youth got the dollar, he started to cry. She says, why are you crying? You should be happy that you got a dollar from the Rebbe. He said, I'll tell you. He says, 23 years ago before that, now it's 26 years, 23 years ago, he says, I was standing on a Sunday in line to get a dollar from the Rebbe. The Rebbe takes a dollar and hands it out to me. But before I had an opportunity to get the dollar, the Rebbe pulled the dollar back. He couldn't understand. And the Rebbe asked me, did you have a bris already? I told him no. And the Rebbe tells me that soon after you will have a bris, you'll get a dollar from me. So he tells this gentleman, why from all the people did you come and ask me who I am? Because the Rebbe saw that I had the bris. The Rebbe had to keep his word that I'm going to get a dollar. The Rebbe saw that you have a dollar with you. So the Rebbe first gave you in your mind that you should come over and ask me who I am. And when you heard that I had the bris, the Rebbe gave you in your mind that you should give him the dollar in order that he should be able to fulfill his promise. Maybe, what did this Maisha tell us? This Maisha tells us that we should not think that there was something of Gimel Tammuz that the Rebbe left us. It's not true. In fact, the Rebbe, the Rebbe brings down in, in, in the Gerdes HaKadosh from the Zayar, the Rebbe is in this world more than he was before. Why? Before the Neshama left the body, so to a certain extent the physical body put a limitation on the Neshama. But once the Neshama is separated from the physical body, so the Neshama can be all over, like Eliyahu Novi. At the very moment that you have a bliss here in Crown Heights, and we say, Zahakishi that very moment there are hundreds of Brisson taking place all over the world. <coughs> and over there you also saw Zahakishi Shalio. How could that be? But because Elio Novi is not bound and he's not limited by his physical body, so the Nishama of, 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 of Elio Novi can be all over the world at the same time. So this is what we have to understand when they get into the Rebbe. The Rebbe saw that this Yid had the bris, the Rebbe saw that this gentleman has a dollar, and through him, he could become the Rebbe Shalil to fulfill his word that he promised this Yid that he's going to get a dollar, and that's what happened. So this Maishi is only to strengthen, in addition to what we have a Muna, what the Zoya says, that Ishtaka Baha'i al that he's on this world even more than before, but the very fact, when you see a factual thing taking place, it's natural that a person has a greater feeling for it. But the Emes, even before Gimel Tammuz, the Rebbe was all over. It was one Saturday night, I was sitting in the office, I received a phone call from a Lubavitcher young man living in another country. And he says, you must do me a favor. I said, what's the favor? He said that yesterday, at a Shabbos, about five, ten minutes before the lighting of the candles, my wife fainted. Wait, 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 wait. He called the, the ambulance and they could not revive her. They had to take her to the hospital. And even in the hospital, they had a difficult time to they revive her. I just came from the hospital and the doctors say that she's still in a very critical condition. So please go into the river. Here's her name and her mother's name. And asked the Rebbe for a bracha that she felt she should be well. Gave over the name, the, the, the thing to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, call him back and tell him two things. Number one, the Rebbe said, tell him that he'll bring at the oil, the Rebbe, and ask her, I'll see him, and I'll mention her at the oil. 
And then the Rebbe says, tell him as follows. Friday night, between 5 o'clock in the morning and 5.30 in the morning, her condition was so serious that the doctors gave up on her. You think that what stabilized her condition was the medical treatment, and the Rebbe says, of Yiddish, nay, no. I thought about her, and because I thought about her, that's what stabilized her condition. And then the Rebbe says, why am I revealing to him that I'm sitting here, in, this one, like the Rebbe said in Yiddish, but this one the Rebbe said, I'm sitting here in Crown Heights, and I know what happened Friday night between 5 and 5.30 in another country. Why am I saying it? I want he should know that you cannot hide from me. Wherever you're going to be, I see where you are. I told the person, I asked him, he says, yeah. Around 5.15 in the morning, the phone rang. I yes, I woke up my grandson, three years old. He should pick up the receiver. And the doctor tells me that the condition became very, very serious. And we don't know how much more time you'll have to say goodbye to try to be here as soon as possible. And from his house, he says, to the hospital, it takes about 20, 25 minutes. When we came to the hospital, so the nurses, the nurses calmed us down and they said the situation stabilized the day. So here, the Rebbe is sitting in Crown Heights and the Rebbe says that he had saw that this woman was in, in a danger and he was thinking about her. But you have to know another thing. One of the conditions that the previous Rebbe made with the Rebbe before the previous Rebbe accepted and agreed that he should become his son-in-law, so one of the conditions were that the Rebbe has to be up every Friday night and learn the whole night, not to go to bed. So five o'clock in the morning, the Rebbe was sitting in his house, sitting and learning. Suddenly, he saw a red light come up, so to say, because you know how today everything is wireless, so you can find even with wires, you can know everything. The wireless, they had the wireless much before it became actually. So the Rebbe saw a red light, and the Rebbe tried to trace it where it's coming from, and he saw. So the Rebbe stopped learning, as the Rebbe says, because he had to think about it. So the Rebbe stopped learning to help this woman. So what is the Rebbe saying? I'm sitting here in Crown Heights, and I see what's happening in another place. We're getting close to Pesach. One year, two days before Pesach, the Rebbe tells me, call up this and this shaliyach in Europe and tell him he has to drop everything he's doing and go to this and this town. And when he's there, he'll find the yid and he'll know what he has to do. I call up the shaliyach and the shaliyach says, have pity on me. I say, what's the matter? He said, we're expecting 400 people to the Seder. It's only two days before Yeltev. We have so much work. To go to that city can take me one way about four or five hours until I come back. So I said, look, the Rebbe told me to tell you, you should stop everything you're doing and go to that city. Go back. I'm just telling what the Rebbe said. Shame. A few weeks after Pesach, I get a call from him. I have to tell you what transpired, what took. I heard such words. I told my wife, you take everything over, I have to go. So I come to that city, it's a small town, we have no yidin, nothing. I went into city hall and I asked him, you have a list of all your members here, is there a Jew over here? No, this city has no Jews. At that time there was no cell phones, he didn't know what, he thought maybe I made a mistake, I gave him the wrong number and he wanted to get it. So he decided to go back, he stops at a, at a gas station, so the owner of the gas station asks him, what is a Jew with a beard doing in our city? So he says, I told him I'm looking for a Jew. This city a Jew? Oh, one minute, he says. A half an hour from here, there's a butcher shop. And I'm almost sure that the owner of that butcher shop is a Jew. This was 5.15. And the, um, gas on, the owner of the gas station gave me directions. He said it should take him about a half hour. He tells me he came there a quarter to six. When he opened the door of the butcher shop and the owner gave a look at him, the owner fell and he fainted. I ran up, 
I picked him up. I washed his face with cold water. Then I said, I don't understand. I didn't come with a gun. I didn't come with a knife. What happened over here? He said, let me calm down and I'll tell you. He says, I am married and we have two young daughters, 16, 17 years old. We are the only Jews in this town. The priest comes to me from time to time and he says, why do you have to be different? Why don't you join us? And I tell him, I don't know what you're talking about. <coughs> don't you know that an older generation, Jewish people, let themselves be killed, thrown into water, thrown into fire? Yet we, we don't do those things. We live with it and we die with that. He said, last week he came to, my, to the store and he says, I am not leaving this place till you promise me you're going to do what I want. So I was thinking, how can I get rid of him? All this he's telling this, Shulich and Shulich was telling me he wanted the Rebbe to know. So I tell him, you know, such a, 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 a drastic move, I can't do it on my own. I have to discuss it with my wife, with my two daughters. They're grown people already. Give me a week. Next week you come and I'll give you my answer. And he tells the Shulich, as soon as this guy left his, his store, he turned to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he says, Rebbeinu Shalom, you must give me a sign that you don't want me to do what he wants. One day passes, another day passes. The day is the last day. He is supposed to come 6 o'clock to get my answer. 5.30, I told my wife, we still have no sign from Hashem. It seems he doesn't care. If he comes, I'll say, okay. You open the door a quarter to six. So I saw Hashem did send me a sign. And I became so emotional, and that's what caused me to faint. So I tell this young man, you hear what you're doing, telling me? When the Rebbe tells you, you must stop immediately, had chas v'sholem, you come five after six, we would have lost not only this family, but everything that would be developed from it. The Rebbe sitting in Crown Heights, he sees that there's a family in Europe that Katsusholim is in danger, and we have to save that family from committing this most severe Avere. And the Rebbe sees that you can be the Shalia to help him, and the Rebbe says, tell him he should stop everything and go immediately. Because the Rebbe knew you have to get there before 6 o'clock. And the line, he, t- he, he, he tells me that he invited them, he told them, being that Pesach is coming up the next two days, so they came to him for Pesach. A f- and then a few years later, the Shaliyah called again. He said, I just came back from Eretz Yisrael, and I'm standing at the Kotel. Someone taps me on my shoulder, and I turn around, and he asks me, do you recognize me? I said, no. I see a yid with a beard, with the tzitzis and everything. He said, look in my eyes. Oi, you're the owner from that butcher shop, that small town. He says, yeah. He says, you remember you invited me and my wife and my daughters to you for Pesach? And after Pesach, you didn't let us go back home. You kept us for a while. And during that time, you taught, your wife and you taught us what a yid is. And when we came back, my wife said that if we are yidin, we have to leave this place and we have to make our yad to go to Exus and live as yidin are living. So not only did the Rebbe save them from not doing what the Goy wanted, but the Rebbe made that they should become Baal and now all the offspring that's going to come generation after generation is like from a Eden. Again, the Rebbe is sitting in Quran Heights. His neshama is, is clothed in a, in a physical body. And still that physical body did not cause any limitation on the Rebbe that he should not be able to see what's happening all over the world. So Mamele, this one has to encourage us that if this was before Gimel Thomas, and as mentioned before, that the Zoya says that now the Rebbe is with us even more than before, we all have to understand. It's not only a question of believing, but we can go story after story to show you, like this Mysore with the Dawa, and the many other stories that we can tell you, where we see that the Rebbe is actually watching over each and every one of us. You know that the Rebbe gave out the 12 psukim and moral chazal to, for children to say. So it was an altar chosad. He says, I'm the Rebbe's a child. So I say the youth based psukim every day also. 
The Rebbe said, children have to say these based on Kaman Hazala. I consider myself a child of the Rebbe. And one, you all know my, uh, my age is so and so. So one of it says, and there's, uh, what, uh, what the Rebbe quotes on the Alter Rebbe in Tanyim, that he ni Hashem needs to follow. The Abish is standing over you. Umabit Allah, when he's watching, and he's checking, he's examining and checking if you are serving for this Baruch the way you have to. The matter says, Tzadikim Doimim Lebeirum. That the Tzadikim are compared to Akadosh Baruch in the Mele. So Bishas it says, Vihine Hashem Nitzvah So being that the Tzadik is compared, so we understand that the same thing is true, Vihine Hareb Nitzvah But then there's something very interesting. Bishas you take out the Chumash Chukas, Pasha Chukas. There's a post in Pasha Chukas that says, the Jewish people spoke against Hakodis Balhu and against Mesha Rabbeinu. What was their complaint? Why did you think about when Mitzrayim and we're going through such difficulty in the desert and as they like it? On the words, what does Rashi say? Rashi says, Hishvu. Ebed Lekoinui. They compared the servant, Meshach Rabbeinu, to Abadish Bauchu. Compared them? Um, on the word Helisunu, Rashi says something different. Shnehem Shogun. When you compare two things, that means they're two separate things, but you can find similarities from one to the other, you can compare them. When you say Shnehem Shogun, it means to say that they're actually equal and the same in every aspect. Says the Rebbe, what does Rashi teach a five-year-old child? Because we know that the Rebbe is saying that Rashi is for Ben Chomish Lamegra. You want to know who Meshach Rabbeinu is. Meshach Rabbeinu is not Rashi, not only Hishvu. They compared to Meshach Rabbeinu with Hodesh Bochum. Shnei Hem Shoven, that they're both equal, it's the same thing. So what do we learn from this? That Meshach Rabbeinu is just like a Kodesh Baruch Hu is all over, and there's no time that we can say that Kodesh Baruch Hu is not here. As the famous story that Sidon tell, that which as the Rebbe Marash was a young boy of four or five years old, one of the rich Sidon in Lubavitch tells the Rebbe Marash, you know something? If you're going to show me where Kodesh Baruch Hu is, I'm going to give you a large amount of money. And what does the Rebbe Marash as a five-year-old child tell him? You know, mister, if you're going to show me where Kodesh Baruch Hu is not, I'll give you even a bigger present. <laughs> the stoking place lays us up on him and they, as the story goes, up, down, west, east, white, we're all over. What is this stuff? Because the first time Kodesh Baruch Hu is all over, and if our Chazal tells us that Meshach Rabbeinu is equal, to God of Mita, Meshach Rabbeinu is all over. And we know that his Pashtun Sikor Zohar says that every generation there is a Yid who has a, a spark of the Neshama of Meshach Rabbeinu, which means that he possesses all the ingredients of Meshach Rabbeinu's Neshama. So it's just like we say that Kodesh Baruch is all over, so this we can actually see that every Rebbe is also over. That's why the Rebbe could see everything that's going on all over the world. What does this have to do? We have to know that the Rebbe is with us and the Rebbe is ready to help each and every one of us. As the Rebbe said that he stopped a minute of learning and what did he do? He thought about this woman to stabilize her physical condition. Which means to say that the Rebbe is here to help us in every way possible. However, we have to open up the channel that, that we have to bring the Rebbe closer to us. He's with us, but it should come in a more inward feeling that we should actually feel and realize that the Rebbe is with us. And besides, we have that feeling, and we know that the Rebbe is with us, that will help, as it says, that he ni Hashem needs to follow up, that the Abish is watching all of us and seeing exactly how we're behaving, so that will help us that knowing that we have the Koyuch of the Rebbe, that our behavior should be coinciding with what Hashem expects of us and what the Rebbe expects of us. So this is also what it comes in the Megillah. Which the Chazal say, that just like Moshe Rabbeinu was the leader of the Jewish people, and he saved the Jewish people, 
The same thing is also the modern as Mordechai B'deirei. Mordechai also saved the Jewish people, and he's compared to Moshe Rabbeinu. So we see that the Chazal say that in every generation, the Tzadik Hador is compared to Moshe Rabbeinu. But all this that's being discussed is what Tzidim, which has Mazit and Fabreng, so Elton Tzidim always used to emphasize how much we have to appreciate and understand that we have Abishim with us, and but the bank my as the Chazal and and down the brings it down and paid in base of Tanya. The he actually dober by Kodesh Borhu can we cleave by work into Kodesh Borhu? The say the Chazal, he dovik but Talmud and Khachomim cleave to the Talmud and Khachomim, and through that you will be able to connect yourself to our Kodesh Borhu. From this we understand that just like we know that the Abish is here. But in order that we should be able to have that direct connection, so the Chazal tells us, and the Alter Rebbe brings it down in Tanya, that it has to go through the Rebbe, through the Talmud and Chacham and through the Rebbe. So all this is just to encourage us even more and more how much we have to strengthen our his kashos to the Rebbe. His kashos means that the Alter Rebbe says in in Hayyim Yim, his kashos means that we have to learn the teachings of the Rebbe. And we have to fi- follow the guidance, the instructions of the Rebbe. The Mel Hashem shall help us as we're coming from Purim. And Purim reminds of us, Motcha Bedele, Kamesha Bedele, that that should encourage us that we should try to stand to, uh, strengthen our discussions to the Rebbe, which means to try to uh, do everything, uh, our behavior should coincide, and should be di- dictated and directed how the Rebbe wants us to live. And the Abish should tell them that that's who's that we found that opens up the channels from which the Kodesh Baruch and the Rebbe brings down everything that each and every one needs. L'chaim, l'chaim. Tell you something about this nigun. Those of us that remember the Rebbe when he arrived in America of Chesed and Tovshin in 1941, and then before Sukkis of, of Tovshin Beis, the previous Rebbe asked the Rebbe that he should set aside one night of Simchus Beis Hashayivu to make a fabrengen for Talmida Yeshiva, for students, not only for Chabad Lubavitch, for all of New York. So the Rebbe said at night, that night when the Rebbe came into the sukkah, he took a piece of mezainis, and he made mezainis, and made leisha basukah, and then he took a tea glass, and he filled it up with vodka, he made shahaku, and the first drink that he took, he made sure that it should be half, more than half of the glass. And then the Rebbe said a sikhe, and after the sikhe, the Rebbe started a nigga. After a few minutes, the Rebbe got up and he said, he wants that we should have a coffee around all the tables on the sukkah. After dancing for a while, the Rebbe picked up his hand, and the Rebbe said, at kan ha Simchus Beis Hashem, it's not some Chastei, it's not me, and I said, I'm going to go follow. The Rebbe sat down, he took the bottle and filled up the glass again, and again he made sure that he's drinking more than half. He said a sikha, he started singing the same thing again. The same thing happened the first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time. After the fourth Hakofa, the Rebbe said, that the other three hakofis he's going to finish making a fabrengen shmini atzeres. But after each of those sikhis, the only nigun that the Rebbe sang was this nigun. The same thing happened in Tovshin Al, Tovshin Beis, Tovshin Gimel, Tovshin Dalit, He, Vov, Zayin, Ches, Tes, Yud. The only nigun that the Rebbe sang was this nigun. So those of us that remember that, we consider this Rebbe, the Rebbe's nigun. That's why whenever during the fabrengen, they would start this nigga and the Rebbe would go overboard, so to say, <laughs> make with his hands and get very, very frail with this nigga. 
So l'chaim, l'chaim. Speaking about stories, you know that we had this uh, Hasidic artist, Rabbi Handel Lieberman, I'm sure you've heard of him. His brother was, he's the brother of Rabbi Handel Putofas. He told us that one day the Rebbe called him. And the Rebbe tells him that the Rebbe said he heard that in the next week or ten days, somewhere in Middle America, there's going to be an art exhibition. And the Rebbe tells Rabbi Hendel, I would want that you should participate in that art exhibition, meaning to say, take all your Hasidic art and exhibit over there. And then the Rebbe tells him that although in that city there are many Hasidim, it will be only a happy to accommodate you, but I want you should take a room in one of the biggest hotels in the city. And Hendel says, because I'm the same, but you don't ask questions, if the Rebbe says, you do what he says. He says he came to the city and he rented a booth where he should be able to exhibit his art and he took a hotel, one of the biggest hotels. He said the morning before he went to the exhibition, he doubted. Before he left his room, somebody's knocking on the door. He opens the door and standing over there, middle age, and he says, could I borrow your thousand films? He says, of course. He gives me the thousand films. And he said that his seed went back to his room and he started to love him. After 10, 15 minutes, he said he heard that he's crying bitter tears. And the Bendel said, I wished at that moment that on your keeper, I should dub him the way he dubbed them. He said that the fellow finished the Talisman film, he came back, he gave it to me, and we went to the art exhibition. The next morning, the same thing happened again, and the same thing happened on the third day. So then what tells us on the third day when he gave me back the thousand film, I tell this gentleman, listen, today one o'clock the art exhibition is closing. Three, four o'clock I'm taking a plane back to New York. What are you going to do tomorrow morning for thousand film? So the, he tells him, listen, till I was 15 years old, I was a very Hasidic Shabbat with all the trimmings. I don't know what happened. I stopped befriending a group of boys and slowly but surely, they pulled me away, and he tells our Bendel, it's already 35 years since the last time that I put on film. When I heard you davening this morning, it took me back to my young days, and I became very aroused, and I said to myself, I have to do something positive. So I took upon myself that I'm gonna start putting on film. I have thousand film in my home, and I'm gonna start putting on thousand film. Said Rebbe, now you understand why did the Rebbe tell me not to go to some Chosset's house, I should take a room in the big hotel, because the Rebbe saw that he would be able to save this neshama when he'll hear me davening. Again, the Rebbe is sitting here in Brooklyn, and he sees what's happening somewhere in mid-America. And the Zemaisa told of the Rebbe Marash, Rebbe Maraj had two gaboyim, two secretaries, you want to call it. The Rebbe Maraj was very fluent in French. The gaboyim said that one afternoon, suddenly, the Rebbe Maraj opens the door from his office and he tells us, we must go immediately to Paris. The first train that's going from Lubavitch, near Lubavitch, to Paris, we have to take it. Shame. They came to Paris. So they asked him, where does he want to stay? So he named the biggest hotel in Paris. At that time, to be the biggest hotel in Paris, a Frumayid was not allowed to be there. It was contrary to modesty, contrary to everything of Sinis that has to be in that time. But the Rebbe Maras said, so they came to the hotel. They asked him, which floor do you want to be? Because on the ground, on the first floor, they had that very big hole. And Dalton over there, you know how it was, the exposures over there was unbelievable. And they didn't believe that he, so he says, I want the room that's closest to the hall. Okay. So they took the room. After 20 minutes, the Rebbe Marash comes out, they say, and he stands by the door and surveying everything that's going on in that hall. He said, we ran away because we couldn't see what was going on over there. Everything, Hepechatsinius on the highest level. 
after about five, six minutes, the Rebbe Barash goes into the hall. And he goes over to one of the tables. They were sitting men and women. And he goes over to one younger man, one gentleman, and he taps him on his shoulder. And he says, you're not allowed to drink wine that a great torch, you're not allowed to drink because it affects your mind. He waited a minute or two, and he did it a second time, and he made, then he did it a third time. They say when the Rebbe Marash came out of the hall, at that time there were no elevators. What did you do if somebody lived on the top floor? So they had chairs, and they had very strong people that they would carry you up. The Rebbe Marash, when he came out of the hall, he was so emotional that he sat down in one of those chairs. So the people ran over right away, and they asked him in French, where does he want to go? He said, pardon, pardon, I'm sorry. I have my room over here. And he asked him, how much would you charge if I was on the top floor? They told him. He took out francs, and he paid them as if they were, He picked himself up, and he went back into his room. About 20 minutes later, this gentleman, that the Rabbi Baras tapped him on his back, comes out of the hole, and he says, where did I be? And I want to speak to him. So they went in, the Rebbe Marash said he should come in. He was by the Rebbe Marash for two hours. And the Gaboy said when he came out, his face was red like a tomato. <laughs> After he came out, the Rebbe Marash calls in the Gaboy. He said, mission accomplished. Now we can go back to the Babich. Then they said about a year and a half later, who came to the Babich? This year came with the Babich, with a bed, with other goods. Again, the Rebbe Marash is sitting in Lubavitch. He sees somewhere in Paris, Petrach HaKlippus, from the highest form, is a neshama that has to be saved. He picks himself up, and he travels to Paris, and he gets a hold of this neshama, and then as soon as he's finished, he comes back to Lubavitch. Again, we see that the Rabbeim, the world does not have it any way concealed. In fact, there's a mime that the Tzamech Tzedek wrote, and it's printed in his Sefer, which is called Sefer HaKhakiru. Huh? And the mime starts, Eile HaEidis V'Hakukum HaMishpotim. And in that mime that Tzamech Tzedek says something, something which is something, I don't know how to do, how describe it. And he says, the Chazal tells us that Odom Marishim was able to see from one end of the world to the other end of the world, with the light, that of course both who created that light on the first day, so the Chazal say that the Marisha was able to see from one end of the world to the end. Says it says the Rebbe, it's a Mahzadik, that the Baal Shem Tev said, it wasn't that he had the Ruach HaKodesh, that therefore he was able to see, says the Baal Shem Tev that Odom Marisha with his physical eyes, was able to see from one end of the world to the other end of the world. And then it says the Tzamech Tzedek that the Magid Mimazrich said that the same thing we saw by my Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tev, that he was able to see with his physical eyes from one end of the world to the other. Then it says the Tzamech Tzedek that my grandfather, Dr. Rebbe, said that the same thing we saw by my Rebbe, by the Magid, and then says the Tzemach Tzedek, and the same thing we saw by my grandfather, <coughs> that he was able to see with his physical eyes from one end of the world to the other end of the world. And the Rebbe said many times, why is the new Rebbe that becomes the new Rebbe is called Memali Mokim? He fills up the place. Says the Rebbe, Memali Mokim says that the new Rebbe fills up the place of the previous one. That means he receives all the qualities and all the capabilities that the previous rabbi had, and then he adds on something to it. According to that, if the Tzambach Tzedek says that the Baal Shem Tim was able to see Mishayi for Elam Adasayfim with his physical eyes, the Maggit says that the Baal Shem Tim was able to see the same way. The Alter Rebbe says about the Maggit, the Tzambach Tzedek says the same thing about the Alter Rebbe, so we have to understand that all the Rebbes that follow, they were presented with all those abilities that the previous Rebbe had, but made that means to say that they had that kind of also. So therefore the Rebbe could sit in Crown Heights, 
And as he told this gentleman openly of that Saturday night, tell him that for me it can't hide. That means to say that the Rebbe is able to see what's going on all over the world, even when he had his neshama together with the physical body. And as mentioned before, how much more so now that the Zoya says that being that the physical body does not put any limitations on the neshama now, he can be all over at the same time. All this is what Chesidah must speak of, what is caused by Afan Brengen, is to strengthen us so we should know that the Rebbe Chassosholu did not leave us. Royin Nemun, Ein Oizev, Eshem Arisi, it says Chazal, a faithful shepherd does not leave his flock. He's always with them. It depends how he's with them. Sometimes he with the physical body, sometimes only with the Neshoma. But the Zoya says that Royin Nemun, Ein Oizev, Eshem Arisi. He doesn't. And at the Lashon Chazal, I think one says in the results of Meshach Rabbeinu, Ma'ad Halun, that just like till now he served the Jewish people, even after he passes away, so to say, he also is serving the Jewish people. The male of all this is just to give us more encouragement, more strength, to strengthen our emun, that we have to know that the Rebbe is here, the Rebbe is with us, and the Rebbe is watching over every one of us, and the main thing is that the Rebbe is giving prayer to everybody. There was one day I was by the Rebbe, when I said I was the Rebbe, not because I want to pride myself, because that's how I came out, let me see this. That's how I know the thing to tell you. So I was thinking about the Rebbe, there was a discussion going around about the previous day, Rabbein. And then the Rebbe stops and the Rebbe tells me, today is different than in the previous times. What is different, he says? In the previous generations, they waited, he didn't want to say the word the Rebbe, they waited till they were asked to help. Now the Rebbe says, we don't wait. And the Rebbe went like this. And the Rebbe says, now we pour from above without any stop. We don't wait till you're going to turn to us. But we ask only one request. Give us a plate in which this what we are giving to you should not fall, that the Rebbe said, to the floor, but you should be able to pick it up and use it. But what is the Rebbe saying? He's standing, even when he had a physical body, him pouring, giving us all the brokers and everything that everyone has to have, he is standing there and giving it to us. But he wants that it should not go to waste. So he's asking us for a plea, for a vessel. What is that plea? That plea is to learn the Rebbe's memory, to follow what the Rebbe tells us, and that becomes the vessel in, with, through which we will be able to see all this that the Rebbe is downloading to us, as we call it today, so everyone has to have. So what is the Rebbe saying? In previous generations, they waited till they were asked to help. Today, we don't wait. We give whatever we could, we give to everybody at, or without any limitation. So the Rebbe should help them. The Rebbe should help us that each and every one should appreciate what the Rebbe is doing for us, not waiting for us, but what he says, give me that vessel, and that's very important, that already we have to do ourselves. The Rebbe is not going to give us the vessel. The Rebbe wants that we should give the vessel. And which as we give the vessel, we will receive all the brooks that we have to have. The high and the high. One of the chidushim that the Rebbe introduced to us, which was not known before, is that this year is considered a Shnaz Hakel. There's no source in any of the Rishenim, Achreinim, or before the Rishenim, that after the second night, after the circus at night, when the king made the Hakel, that there should be such a concept that the whole year is considered a Shnaz Hakel, and therefore to make gatherings and so forth. This is one of them, so we say, the introductions that the Rebbe introduced to us that this is an Ashnaz Hakel. And therefore, the Rebbe said each time when a group of people get together, that's considered an Indian from Ashnaz Hakel. What was the purpose of Hakel? So it says in Pesach that the people should hear the portions of Taylor, and that will strengthen their Yiddishkeit and Yerushalayim. One of the things that the Rebbe always wanted is that they should have as many places of shoes to daven. It means to say, 
although people wanted to come to a central place, but if you make the smaller, smaller shoes in a certain respect, it has a greater accomplishment. Why? Because if you have a, 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 large, a large place, a, a big shoe, as I say, that the papers get swallowed up in the rush of papers. The individual loses his identity, he gets lost. And, and not everyone, it, it takes, uh, watches over and look, uh, it, it takes constant of him as they write them. When you have a smaller crowd, you're able, each one should have, express himself, and be able to feel that he's part of what's being done. When the people that ever started the Lubavitch Yeshiva in, in, in New York, so it was a small island, but most of the Bokhun that came were American boys. What do American boys know? Baseball, football, this ball, that ball, those things. Rebzalm Gerard Sholem, he was our principal. And he wanted to inject in the, in the young Bokhrim a more feeling of Siddhis. What would he do? Every Thursday night, he would take three Bokhrim to his house and have with them a private fabringen. What was the purpose of that? He would ask them, tell me, what do you find difficult? What do you have questions? What do you appreciate? And through that, so when they speak in a group of people, people are embarrassed to ask. When the three of them were all, all alone, they were able to open up and speak. In the course of a year, these people were by here maybe four times. I have to tell you, I don't want to mention any names, that there are Siddish in the light today living in Crown Heights. The Ashluchim, out as a result of these small fabrengans that Rab Zalman made, that they became Chsidish Eden, and that they're doing the work with the Rabbi and what the Rabbi wants. So the Rabbi also wanted, in order that the person should not feel that he's just another pawn over here, and he, he can't contribute to anything, or he's not, no, people are not uh, taking cognizance of him as a writer. So that's why the Rabbi felt that we have small crowds. And this, that Shmir at service at night in Simchas before the people come to 770, in the shuls they make the hakofis, you don't know what you are accomplishing with that. Because these Kleine Yingelach, when you come to 770, they got lost. They don't know what's going on. I, there was one year that I wasn't able to walk from my house to 770, after Gimel Thomas, and I dove in, in one of the shuls over there on. Uh, on President Street. I was amazed to see there were maybe 40, 50 people in the shul, about 25, 30 young boys. They participated in every hakofa. They felt that this is for them. And you don't know what that is for them later when they went to 770, they also felt. So when you have a smaller place and you, there's able, an ability to be together and to discuss things privately in, 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 in a way that otherwise it would not be done, it's a gewaltic of things. So in we have to give Rabbi Shushan a grace of Yashikeyach. That you have this in order to utilize it in a proper way. And I say that people have to be machazikit. Okay, don't satisfy yourself with 25 people. You will have 50 people who will also be able to accomplish it. So maybe don't satisfy only with 20, 25 people. I'm trying to say that this is one of the yonim that is being done, that the Rebbe always wanted, because they wanted that every person should feel that he's important. What why he's important? Not to make him about government. He's important enough that he has to hear what's been going on, he has to, he, maybe he could give, contribute something, what could be improved in the writer. He should be part of the entire union. And when you have the smaller, the smaller crowds, you can accomplish much more. So that's one of the things that I'd like to mention. There are people that feel that after Gimel Thomas, as, so let me tell you one or two stories that happened from the oil, which I was the shliach to be for them. When the Rebbe had the stroke in Tov Shinun in, in 1992, the doctors were taking blood and they wanted to have the results as soon as possible. So usually when you go to a blood lab, it takes three, four days till you get the results. They wanted to find a way to get it sooner, so we found that about a half an hour away from Plan Heist, there is a blood laboratory that's owned by two Frumi in the life, Nishkin Lubavitch and 
I called them. They said, if this is for the Rebbe, you bring me the vial, the, the bottle of what, nine, 10 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you have all the results. So, whenever the blood was taken, we would ship out to that place, and 4 o'clock, they would send us the results. A month passed, I called him, and I told him the Rebbe never wanted anything gratis. The Rebbe wanted to pay for everything. I want to have a bill. What is the charge for all these blood tests that you took? Rabbi, don't worry. Month after month, they always told me I'm going to get a bill, and I never got a bill. A week after Gimel Thomas, one of the brothers calls me, and he says, Rabbi, you ready to pay for the entire two months? I said to the last penny, you give me the amount now. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow morning you have a chest, a check on your desk, and you can deposit it, and it's not going to become from a daimim and mahalach. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not going to come back. It's going to go through. He says, I'll tell you what my bill is. My wife and myself are married nine years, and we were not blessed with a child. My bill is a yingle or a maidle, a child, a boy or a girl. That's my bill. I took his name and his mother's name, her name and her mother's name, and the next day I went over to Ontario. That was mama, she said, eight days after the Stalkus. And I told the Rebbe the whole Maise, and I said that the bill is a child. This was Chaydish Thomas, Tovshin Nun Dalit. Yud Dalit Kislev, Tovshin Nun Vav, a year and a half later, on the Rebbe's wedding day, he calls me Madlotov. We had a boy. Two years later, he called me again. We had another boy. And two years later, he called me. We had a maid of it. We go to the oil and we tell the Rebbe what the situation is. Then I got a phone call from an American lady who lives in Manhattan. Uh, my husband lost his job about a year and a half ago, and our uh, savings is going all the way down, and we don't know what to do. We have uh, friends who are the Babacher, and they said that if you get a blessing from the rabbi, things will be okay. So they asked me I should get a blessing for them. So I took her husband's name and his mother's name and her name, and I went to the rabbi, and I told the rabbi, this was on a Monday. She calls me Thursday. She says, Rabbi, I know that you were by the rabbi, you were at the cemetery. I said, how do you know? She said, because yesterday, my husband got two jobs. One job <laughs> wow. from nine to two, and another job from three to seven. Here a year and a half, nothing happened. As soon as I called you, and you went to the rabbi, so he got two jobs now. People that had no shakas to the rabbi, at least what we know, and the Rebbe Geher that these people have to have a bracha. You got a bracha? I'm standing one day at the oil, and a young man comes over to me on a board, I say. He says, Label, you don't know what the Rebbe is doing. Whenever I have a problem, I come here, and the next day or two, the problem is solved. He says, It's going already on for months. Whenever I have a problem, I come here, I tell the Rebbe my problem, and the Eidish to help. Rabbi Klein Oliver Shalom told us in Meissen that he was standing at the oil, and he sees that a black couple walks into the oil and crying bitter tears. So at first he thought they were Ethiopians. After they finished and he went out, so he started speaking to them, he saw that what most of them were black people. He asked them what happened. So they told him that they have a 30-year-old son. He was going with his motorcycle a day or two ago, and he got into a very serious accident. And the doctors told him that it's very, very critical. We heard that when you come to the rabbi, you get blessed. So we came here to bless, plead with the rabbi that he should save our son. <clears throat> two weeks later, says Rabbi Klein, he made him begin at the oil, and this time with a big smile. He asked them what happened. They said, you, the doctor don't believe it. The two days after we were by the rabbi, things changed, and yesterday he came home. So we came to inform the rabbi and to thank him, 
for the blessing that he gave us, that here the doctor said that in critical condition, who knows what's going to be, and as soon as we came to the rabbi, a week and a half later, he's home already. So he came to thank the rabbi. What is this? The rabbi sees everything. The Arizal says something very, very important to know. The Arizal says that Bishas Ayid comes to the oil of a tzaddik, so we know that the body of the tzaddik remains intact. It doesn't disintegrate. And you know the story with the Rabbi Rashab, I don't know if you know, I'll tell you the story. The Rabbi Rashab was buried in Rastov in a certain area. In 1939, Tofei Sadek Tess, Sidon found out that the Russian government want to uproot all the, the, bottom, all the graves, and they want to build a big, big uh, uh, condominium over there. And the Rebbe Rashab was right in the middle. So they sent a message to the Fiddi Rebbe when he was in Atvot, what to do. So the Rebbe answered them that they should get 10 people, that they should fast that day, and that night they should go and take the Rebbe Rashab out of that place where he is and take him to another place where it's, it seems that over there they're not going to bother. Two of these people who were the minion came to the Rebbe in Tovshin Yud Gimel in 1953 to be by the Rebbe for Jesus Tishrei. And they told us, we were part of the ten. He said it was Mamash HaSakon Gedeil. It was 12, 1 o'clock at night and there was no moon. Of course, we prayed that early in the city. And we started uncovering the earth and we almost fainted. The body of the Rebbe Rashab was intact. Nothing was missing. We thought he was sleeping. He said, all, the, all, all of us, we all saw that. We able, we picked up the body and we transferred it to the other place in Baruch Hashem. So we see some Tarizal that the body of a tzaddik remains intact, it doesn't disintegrate. We know that every neshoma has five levels. Nefesh, Ruach Neshoma, Chaya Yechidin. When the person passes away, so the neshoma goes up the mile. And the Buddha says, and Tesla said that there are certain neshoma in certain times that the neshoma for the first year would come back again, but then after the first year the neshoma goes up and never comes back to the Bible. But at Tzadik it's different. The level of Nefesh as we say in the Zayah, when we go to the Eil, that always remains floating, says the Arizal, over the physical body of the Tzaddik. And says the Arizal, Bisha Sayyid comes to pray at the oil of the Tzaddik, this level of Nefesh co connects itself, puts itself in the physical body, and the physical body, nase chai mamish, as that is all. The body becomes a live body, and therefore the tzaddik hears everything and sees everything. And from that we can tell you many stories. So what does it mean? That Bishas, you come to the earth and you're asking the rabbi, he sees everything going on. A young man told us one time that he was at the oil, and there was a 20-year-old boy that asked him to give him a ride back through Crown Heights. And... His 20-year-old Bokhla sat next to the driver. After we left the oil, he fell asleep. After a short while, he wakes up and starts screaming, Oy vey! So the driver asked him, what are you crying? What are you screaming about? He said, you won't believe me. I'll tell you. The Rebbe came to me, and the Rebbe asks me, how is it that a Bokhla from Temechot Mimim came to me with Alat Alat without your tzitzis. So the driver says, I picked up his shirt and there was no talus cotton. He said, what happened? He said, I forgot into the mix, whatever it was. So what does this tell us? And then later we, we spoke to the book of himself. He says, 100%. The Rebbe came to me when the Rebbe tells me, we come to a book of himself will come on a talus cotton. Come without a talus cotton. So that shows what that is, that says that the, the tzaddik becomes a live mamish. And actually he says it in three places, not only in one place, he repeats it twice again. It's found out in the quote, Shad Ruach HaKadosh. From that is out, so he writes in three different places over there. So what does this mean? That the tzaddik is here, 
And the tzaddik hears everything and he sees everything. And therefore, when we come to the tzaddik, it was one by a bal mitzvah, about 300 people there. So the father of the bal mitzvah called up a modern Orthodox rabbi to say a few words in honor of the bal mitzvah. So he says, being that a lot of Lubavitch shall see them are sitting here, I want to tell you a personal story that happened with <coughs> me, with the Rebbe, after Gimel Thomas. He says that I was sitting in my office one day, and a young woman walks into the office and sits down and she cries. No, I'm accustomed. People come, you know, to vent themselves. So I asked her, what are you crying about? She says that her husband left about two, three years ago, and he refuses to give her, get a divorce. And I'm a young lady yet. I want to get married. I want to have a child. And nothing helps. I want you to get my husband to give me a gift. So I took his name and his phone number and in. He says, nothing doing. I'm not going to let this woman get married again. She comes back a week later and he asks her, no. He says, no go. A few days later, she comes with her valise. He says to the crowd, and she says, I am not leaving this office till you get me a get. Nothing's going to help you. Because I was told that you can have an influence. So he tells us he didn't know what to do. And finally, he came up on night there. He tells this woman, I'm sure you heard of the Baba Sharebbe. Many people go to his uh, grave and they get blessed. Tomorrow, 9 o'clock in the morning, I'll pick you up and we'll, you go to the grave and tell the Rebbe your problem, see what's happening. He tells his whole crowd. The woman came for an hour. She was standing and crying and crying. The Rebbe helped me, Rebbe helped me, he must help me. Shane, after she finished, we went back into the car and her phone rings. She picks up the phone. This is her lawyer. Your husband just called me that he decided to give you a divorce. So I took the phone, he says, and I told the lawyer, tell that man, this was about four or five o'clock, that seven o'clock today he should be in my office. I'm going to have the cipher there. I'm going to have the witnesses, and I want the get to be given. I'm afraid that he should go to sleep. He'll get up tomorrow morning on the left side, and he'll forget about it. So being that it was agreeable to get it, give it, he should come. And he tells us, 7 o'clock, the gentleman was there, and he had prepared everything. By 8 o'clock, they got the get. He says, for two, three years, nothing helped. She came to the Rebbe, and she really meant what she said, and the Rebbe heard her. Why suddenly would he not wouldn't want to give the gift? But the Rebbe put into his mind, you have to help him. So we see that you come to the oil, and, and, and you get, and, and this, this and, and he's not a Baba Chachosan, he's a modern Orthodox rabbi in Flatbush. And he told us, they said, there's a Maisa Shehoya, I can give you the name of this young lady, and she'll tell you exactly what happened. So what do we see from all this? That we have to know the Rebbe's though. The whole Nakud of all this is to say, we have to know the Rebbe is with us, and the Rebbe is listening to us, and the Rebbe is, as we said before, the Rebbe is ready to help each and every one, but we have to make the proper connection, we have to give him the proper vessel with which to receive the brokenness that the Rebbe wants to give us. So we can sit over here and tell you more and more facts, facts that are taking place. You, can, you, know, you cannot deny it, these are actually things that are taking place. Many, many, many other different stories about about Panos, about Gesund, about Shiduchim. <laughs> the one young man came to my office to say, you won't believe it. I have two daughters of age. When she gave me say, I can't find a Shiduch. So three months ago, I came to the oil, and I told the Rebbe, I'm going to give the Rebbe's mice a certain amount of money, but not because of that. I want to make a channel, and my channel will be the Tzedakah, and the Tzedakah will be the Tzedakah. And he says, a week later, my daughter was introduced to a young man, Lubavitch Chosid, and she gave off a vague. It's going in the proper direction. I decided to go again to ask for my second daughter. I came and I told the Rebbe, I'm going to add to that, to widen, I want to widen the channel. And two weeks later, she met a boy. So we see that uh, as a gate, 
So he comes to the Rebbe, and the Bet and Rebbe, and the Mata came in, so the Bet and Rebbe, he get help. And maybe all this just to encourage us, to strengthen us, how much more we have to strengthen our Muna. And the Rebbe wanted not only the Muna should be for us, we have to strengthen our family, the wives and the children. That say that from this, and as we find now, that by the building of the, of the Mishkan, who were the first ones that gave for the Mishkan were the women. And very interesting thing, we speak and we learned last week about the kir, but to, to make, or this with the pastor's kisi, so the kir, to make the faucet with <coughs> which the coin them how to wash their hands and feet. What, from what did they make this faucet? From the Maris Hatsavis. That was a copper thing that Bishas the Abishna told the Eden in Mitzrayim that they have to have children. The men refused. Of course, why? Because they knew that party is going to do so and so. Says in Medrash that the wives used to beautify themselves and took these copper uh, 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 pieces, what they want to call it, and showed it to the husband, and the husband should see them, and as, and that he attracted them. When he came to build the Mishkan, so Rashi says that Moshe Rabbeinu refused to take these items. He said if these items were used for something not Sneistic, he doesn't want to put them into the base of Mish, into the Mishkan. <laughs> Rashi says it. What does Rashi say? Omar God is on the Moshe that this is the first thing that has to be. Because the women went on and said, it's They knew that was gonna happen. And they knew that they have a moon that I'm gonna save them. So these, these, these so mirrors, you wanna call them, that they used in order to have children, that is the main thing that I want. And that's why that becomes the basis that a coin was not allowed to do his Aveda before he washed his hands with this faucet. So this faucet became, so to say, the foundation from which the Koyin was able to do his Avedin. So the Mishidus Nefesh of the women, that's what helps. So that's what the Rebbe said, that the, the women are the ones who have a Gabaldic Koyin that they could accomplish. So now when we speak over here, how much we have to strengthen our Muna, it has to be conveyed to them also. And they have a Muna, but the game of they should hear more mices and more stories that we'll even make, and also the children should also be educated. There was one time the head of all the Mizrahi educational organizations in Hetzestral. The Mizrahi is a modern, modern Orthodox organization. When he came out of the Rebbe, he tells me that one of the things that I asked the Rebbe, what can we do in our educational uh, organization to strengthen more Yiddishkeit, more Yiddish mind to the students? And you know what the Rebbe told me? Make sure that you're in curriculum three times a week, the children should hear a Hasidish And the Rebbe said, when a child hears a Hasidish that imbues him, that gives him more in Yerim for Yerushalayim. So the Rebbe says, a simple from a tzaddik, that's most of Yerushalayim. So our children have to hear more and more, as the Rebbe said, that the more, as I said, and we started off, that the more Sipurim they're going to hear, that will strengthen more and more the Yerushalayim. So these are some of the things that we should take with us, <coughs> how much we have to help ourselves, strengthen ourselves, strengthen the family, the wives, the children, <coughs> When Machazik said Alaman, and the Nakuda is that we have to have a Munak shooter that the Rebbe is with us. Machayim, Machayim. There was a family in Williamsburg, Hungarian family. At that time, they had a 16 year old son. They took him out of the Hungarian machine, and they sent him to Lubavitch. Of course, as time went on, this fellow became a full-pledged Lubavitch Lachoset. When he came to the time for a Shidduch, so it was proposed to him about a Shidduch. So as the custom is, they wrote in <coughs> to the Rebbe, both sides, to ask the Rebbe whether to meet, and the Rebbe said to meet. He went and he called his parents, and he told them that there's a proposal about a Shidduch, and the Rebbe gave okay to meet, so I want you to know, 
So the parents said, yeah, but we'd like to check out who she is in a survival. A few days later, they called him, and they said that although we had good regards, but you're two different types, and we don't think that you're going to merge together, so we don't think you should get involved with him. So he said, but I have a brocha from the Rebbe, but we're your parents. At any rate, of course, they continued to meet till they came to a point that they were ready to get a brocha. So they sat down and wrote a letter to the Rebbe, and he wrote in his letter that his parents are not agreeable. And the Rebbe answered, Yehei ha-shiduch b'shotei v'mislachas, they should go look through the shiduch. Because the Ramo Paskins, and Hilchus Kibbet Ava Em, that there are two areas that one does not necessarily have to obey his parents. One is what he, where he wants to learn. The Olam Yilmud Odom B'mokim Shali B'chobim, it's a place you should learn when he has a feeling. And when it comes to a shiduch, says the Ramo, he doesn't have to listen to them. He can even go against them, and he's not able, he's not transgressing. So the Rebbe wrote, So the boy went, and he called up his parents and told them, Mazel Tov. What kind of Mazel Tov? He told you not to go. He said. A few days later, the mother came to 770, and she went into the Zal, and she went over to him, and she smacked him in his face, that's what the Bokhan told me. And she told her, you will not marry this young lady. <coughs> when she came out, so the Bokhan told her, why don't you go into the room, present your point of view, maybe the Rebbe will agree to you. And that's how I know the story, because she, she came into the office, and she told me the whole miser, and this was on a Tuesday. So I told her, come Thursday night, 9 o'clock with your husband, and you'll go in for your kids. She came nine o'clock with her husband, and she went into Yechidus. The Bokh was standing outside, very anxious to hear what's going to be over here. When they came out, so the Bokh asked the new, we're 100% for the Shidduch. <laughs> so they asked her, they asked her, so they said like this, when we came in, so my husband told her, he presented to the Rebbe the reasons why we feel that it's not, you know, a, a good thing. So he, this is what the Rebbe told us, they say. And the Rebbe told us that when a boy and a girl ask me whether to meet, before I answer them, I go up the mile in heaven, and I check all the, bo all the books about Shidduch. If I don't see anything negative, I give my consent. When I received the letter from your son and the other party, I checked all the books of Shidduchim. I didn't see anything negative. I told them they should meet. When your son sent me the second letter, which they didn't know about, and in that letter he wrote that you are against it, so the Rebbe tells the parents, I thought maybe there was one Sefer Shidduchim that I overlooked. So this time he, the Rebbe says, see, they said the Rebbe told them that this time I made sure to go through all the books, and in none of the books that I see anything negative, that's why I gave the bracha. So they say that if over here, if over here is sitting at Sadiq, that he is able to go up in heaven, the mile in Bashamayim, and he is able to check the books, and over there is nothing negative, who will beat him in negative? <laughs> but what happened over here? The Rebbe should reveal that he is able to go up in heaven. And here the Rebbe, the Rebbe says, and the Rebbe's hearts and lechens, he tries to conceal all his greatness. But because it came over here, Sholem Bayez, the Rebbe wanted to make a Sholem Bayez between the parents and the Bokha. And then eventually to make Sholem Bayez between the Bokha and his future wife. So the Rebbe stepped out, so to say, of his limitations, of his conduct, in order to help a family. But this Maishas shows us the Mishra's Nefesh on the Rebbe's part, that he should reveal to them things which he always, he would try to conceal, but in order to help another family to make Shalom bias, the Rebbe over, over, uh, passed that over, and he, and he, uh, and he made he showed what it is. Again, it's not over here to tell us the Kayach of the Rebbe, that he's able to see, Yogis and Nishkas, that's not my business, you get an answer from the Rebbe, that's important to me. But here we're trying to learn from this Maishra, how much you have to do Matzad Avos Yisrael, sometimes, or maybe more than sometimes, you have to forego your, so to say, limitations, your standards, 
what you made for yourself, and sometimes you have to jump over that in order to help another person, help another family. That's the reason why we tell this Meister. The Rebbe went out of his way, contrary, contrary to what the Rebbe said, that his way is always hasan lechis. No. When it comes to a situation where I have to help somebody, all that falls by the side way, and I have to help the people. And so that's this, that we say, the lesson of this Meister and how much we have to have Abbas Yisrael. So they shall help in all these different things over here, she strengthen each and every one of us in the moon in the Rebbe, in this Haskus and the Rebbe, and that we should fulfill what the Rebbe asks us to do. The one union is what you're doing over here to making these shoes and, 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 and all the other mitzvahs that we're doing. The Nikunda over here is that by doing this, we are connect, connect, strengthening our connection. But they shall help and that we shall not have to, have to speak about all this. And as the saying is in Yiddish, we should be able to see the Rebbe in the physical body. It says by Yankel Vovinu that we shall listen in come. It says, by Yemoy Yanki Vihinochim. Yanki refused to be consoled by the family. So Rashi says, the Gemara said that you don't receive condolence for a living being. Being that uh, uh, Yosef Atzadeh was all alive, Yankiv didn't know that he was alive. And the Rebbe says, Yankiv Levina tells his children, everything you tell me about Yosef Atzadeh is very, very appreciable. But so long, the Rebbe said, I don't see Yankiv in, Yosef in front of my eyes, and I cannot touch him with my physical body, I have no condolence. My only condolence is when I'll see him with my physical eyes and I'll be able to touch him. This is why we have to tell about this Baruch All these interesting things that are being told, how the Rebbe's Mitzvah had a hand, that's not our condolence. The only way you can console us is the Shas will see the Rebbe the Matam Asaratwakim. We won't touch him, but we should be able to touch him. And then we know that that's our Nacham. And they said, Well, hold him, that it should be taken from Yad Mamish. Amen. Amen. Amen.